Now thank we all, our God. With hearts and souls and voices, I hope every part of your being is thankful to the God of heaven who has given to us richly all things to enjoy. We'll turn back to that passage there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, though I read from two different passages. We'll be looking at 1 Thessalonians 5.18 today. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In everything. In everything. After I got back last night from attending a special reception for my son and his new bride, a very long ways out in Pennsylvania, but it was a very nice reception, uh, I checked my email. And uh, I got back at 11 p.m. last night, so I checked it very early this morning uh, when I came over to turn on the heat and set things up over here. But uh, there was a, an email from a a Christian ministry for which I pray in Israel and they had a sort of a banner at the head of their email that they were sending and it said this and I thought wow this morning a lot of us could be very very poor here's what that email banner said how much would you have if the only things you had this morning were the things that you gave thanks for yesterday. <laughs> Think about that. How much would you have this morning if the only things you had were the things for which you gave thanks yesterday? I suspect that most of us would be very, very poor indeed we probably wouldn't even have clothes to put on this morning. When we woke up, we might be sleeping on the bare ground because we didn't give thanks for the dwellings in which we live. We probably wouldn't have cars to have gotten here this morning. We wouldn't have had a refrigerator. We wouldn't have had food in it. We might not have had family members. We might have been all alone. We probably wouldn't have had our bank accounts. How much would you have if the only things you had this morning when you woke up were the things that you gave thanks for yesterday? Do you understand how our text applies? In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. And that's where you are according to Ephesians 1. You are in Christ. You are in him. You are in the beloved. In Christ Jesus. And it's not abstract. In Christ Jesus concerning you. Thanksgiving. In everything give thanks. That is thanksgiving in the will of God. Thanksgiving for the things that God has done. How does the will of God relate to thanksgiving? We want to look at that this morning. Thanksgiving is centered around the God of the universe. Proper thanksgiving is to be directed to the Lord. All that we have and all that has come from his gracious and benevolent hand are things for which we should give thanks. God is the creator. He is the sustainer. He is the provider. He is the protector. How long ago was it that you thanked him for being creator and sustainer? How long ago was it that you thanked him for being protector? How long ago was it that you thanked him for being your provider? He's good. He's patient. He's long-suffering. He's kind. He's generous. He knows our needs before we ask. He answers our prayers before we pray. His sovereignty ordains all that comes to pass before it happens. John Calvin once rightly stated, It is the highest worship to God when we acknowledge his goodness by thanksgiving. The Bible says that it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. 
But Psalm 92, 6 says that the brutish man does not understand this. He thinks like a brute, that is like an animal, like any other creature that doesn't have a moral consciousness, without any sense of moral consciousness or any moral obligation for thanksgiving. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said this about thanksgiving, it is good ethically for it is the Lord's right to require thanksgiving of us. It is good emotionally for it is pleasant to his heart. It is good practically for it leads others to follow the same example. What kind of example are you setting for your children and grandchildren? Do they always hear thanksgiving coming from your lips? Do they always see thanksgiving in your life? Your co-workers, do they hear you grumbling or do they hear you giving thanksgiving? Are you motivating others to thanksgiving? Or motivating them to complain and murmur and gripe about what you think you don't have? Thanksgiving, back to Haddon Spurgeon. To give thanks to God is but a small return for the great benefits wherewith he daily ladeth us and if by his spirit he calls it a good thing, we must never despise nor neglect it. Thanksgiving is never out of season, never superfluous, and a day without thanksgiving, now listen to his last words, is a day profane, unquote. Ah, dear people, thanksgiving is not just one day a year. For the believer, thanksgiving should be 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every week of the entire year, every month of the year. Our hearts should be thankful hearts, filled with the praises to God for who he is, thanking him for what he has done. That's the difference between praise and thanksgiving. Praise is directed at God for who he is. Thanksgiving is directed at God for what he has done. The first stage of thanksgiving, thanksgiving focused on God and articulated as a humble acknowledgement that God is good and wise, was understood well by our forefathers, both as we look at the pilgrims and the founders of our country, though many today try to deny that and call it Turkey Day. Or, <laughs> I saw another very interesting uh, email from uh, Creation Ministries that we have supported and that we have uh, had here speak in this church. Uh, and it shows a man standing under the sky, and the sky arrayed above him like this, Oh, thank you, thou impersonal universe, that I'm here. <laughs> the evolutionary philosophy. You know, evolution is merely a restatement of Romans chapter 1, where it says, When they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart was doctrined. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made it like unto corruptible man and birds and four-foot beasts and creeping things. They turn and look back at the creation and say, thank you for being my creator. Creation, some evolutionary process from goo to the zoo to you. Dear people, thanksgiving is the heart of the true believer. Thanksgiving is the foundation of our land. We've moved into the last stage of thanksgiving, away from that first stage, the stage in which we find ourselves characterized by football, foolishness, feasting, and forgetting the God who has given us richly all things to enjoy rather than fasting, repentance, prayer, and honoring God with humble hearts. The Bible tells us that the lack of genuine thanksgiving is one of the principal marks of a decadent culture which is about to be cursed and judged by God. I quoted it to you just a moment ago from Romans 1, 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful. Do you want to be salt and light in your community? Do you want to fulfill the mandate that Jesus gave to us to be that salt and light? Do you know where it begins? with a thankful heart that is expressed by a thankful voice, that is expressed by the thanksgiving which we give to the almighty God, the creator, by being thankful in our daily conversations, in our daily interactions, in our daily relationship with other people, learning to give thanks. And most of us can't even text a thank you. 
We just take and never say thank you. We just grab and expect it because it's our right. And we never say thank you. The thankless heart of the American culture has permeated the church of Jesus Christ. Thanksgiving. After that passage we just read in Romans chapter 1, Paul then describes the downward spiral to destruction and death through the descending levels of darkened hearts, foolishness, rebellion, hate, covetousness, evolutionary idolatry, immorality, sodomy, and the reprobate mind. You'll find every one of those elements in that passage in Romans chapter 1. He says God turned them over to their own lusts. And then he lists what we have seen in America with a downward spiral toward the bottom where God finally judges. The Bible tells us of the kind of thanksgiving that pleases God. In 2 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 31, Judah had been in a state of national apostasy. The temple had been abandoned and used as a trash dump. The priests and the Levites had been unemployed for years, for there are none who remembered the worship of the true God. And God moved on the heart of Hezekiah, a descendant of David, and the twelfth sovereign, excluding the usurper Athaliah, of the separate kingdom of Judah, which was divided from the northern kingdom of Israel in the days of Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. Hezekiah was only 25 years old when he began to reign. 25. Some of you are just slightly under that age. Most of us are a lot older than that age. But he was 25 when he began to reign. But he turned to the Lord God with all of his heart. He, quote, did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, unquote, from the very first day of his reign. He reopened and repaired the temple. He reconsecrated the priests and the Levites. He required them to sanctify themselves and to clean the house of God. He called the entire nation to repentance. He reminded them of all that they had lost in war, including their wives, their sons, their daughters, as a judgment from God. The Levites and priests worked diligently and cleaned the inner part of the temple in eight days. They finished the temple court cleaning in eight more days. The heart of the king and of the people was filled with praise and thanksgiving. And so what did Hezekiah do? Say, okay, good job, boys. Get your paychecks and go home and have a party. Is that what he did? No. Hezekiah called for a day of thanksgiving. I've preached on that in past years. Not because they would have a feast, but because the worship of the one true God had been restored. Ah, uh, if we could remember that when we have our thanksgivings, not merely just having a feast, but because the worship of the one true God had been restored. They weren't just lethargically lounging around in a stuffed stupor. They had a time of energetic and robust singing and praise for Jehovah God. Sacrifice, praise, thanksgiving, worship, singing, and music upon the many generational old instruments of King David. They brought out those old instruments and played them, and the service of the house of the Lord was set in order. Stop and think about that. Oh, we have so much here. You look at the buildings around us. I pray that God would fill these seats once again with people who give him thanksgiving and praise. What a marvel that would be. Within two weeks, there was a miraculous change in the heart of the nation. When was the last time you thanked God for the United States of America and prayed that our president, vice president, our senators and representatives, our Supreme Court, all of our lower courts, our governors throughout the United States and all of the, the governmental entities that rule over this land, would turn to Christ. Would that be cause for thanksgiving? If you think the salvation of all of our national, state, and local leaders would be cause for thanksgiving, say amen. amen. That's not very hearty. Let's hear it again. Amen. amen! Pray for them. Pray for their salvation. That we might have national revival. That would be truly a cause for thanksgiving. What a day of rejoicing that would be. We saw that in Colossians. 
Be ye thankful. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. You know, as we look at this, we have to put God back on the throne of our hearts. We have to have his peace ruling our lives. And when that happens, we have thankful spirits. That sets the stage so the word of Christ that dwells inside of us can dwell there richly. The thankful heart will delight to teach and admonish with music and psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. It will fill our hearts with what the text calls singing with grace to the Lord. Ah, singing with grace to the Lord. Grace is the unmerited favor of God. It will change our lives so that whatever we do or say will be in the name of the Lord Jesus. Look at that last phrase. Giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. That is, by the Lord Jesus. Did you know you cannot give true thanks to God the Father without Jesus? And because of Jesus, your heart, if it's truly regenerated, must give thanks because of Jesus. In everything, give thanks. That's our text today. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Let's take it a piece at a time. In everything. In other words, nothing in this life is excluded. Nothing. If it's a good time, we have an easy time giving thanks to God. But if it's a hard time, a lot of us like to moan and groan and grumble and complain and wish that it was different instead of giving thanks. Did you know that nothing happens in your life apart from the sovereign will of God. The sovereign will of God is in control. And God brings things into our life that sometimes are unpleasant because he is refining us. He is burning the sin out of our lives. He is burning the sludge out of our lives. He's burning the dross, as it's called in Scripture, out of our lives. He's removing the elements that do not give him praise. And we like to hold on to those things, the things of earth, the things of this world, the things of of the flesh. And sometimes, unfortunately, even the things of the devil, as we talked about on Reformation Day, which the world calls Halloween, Christians who hang on to the things of the devil. First John tells us, for this purpose was the Son of God manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Why would a Christian celebrate the works of the devil? When we go through life, our life is to be filled with thanksgiving. It can only be when it's focused on Jesus Christ and everything in life that does not focus on Jesus Christ, God is going to send trouble into your life to burn it out and then, unfortunately, we complain. Instead, we should say, thank you, Lord. You are in the process, not just you have saved me. Oh, yeah, I've got my fire insurance. I'm out of hell and into heaven. But thanking him for the way in which he is conforming you to the image of Jesus Christ through the hard things of life. In everything, give thanks. Oh, how we don't like that, but that is what it says. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, so it includes little stuff too, like what did you have for breakfast this morning? Did you drink some orange juice along with it? Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. He must be our central focus. And that will bring him praise. That's concerning who he is. That will bring him thanksgiving. That's concerning what he has done. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. This is not merely an individual practice. This is to be the practice of the church corporate. Did you get that? It says the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many. As we join together in thanksgiving, that gives a a reverberating echo to the glory of God. And when others see that, they say, you know, maybe Thanksgiving Day has more to it than football and turkey and belching. Thanksgiving is not Turkey Day. Thanksgiving is a day where we focus on the creator of the universe who has given us richly all things to enjoy. The next phrase here is, in everything, give thanks. 
It doesn't say ask for thanks. It says give thanks. Thanksgiving is externally directed to someone who has done something for you that you did not deserve. Evoking a response of gratitude from the heart. But unfortunately, we as Americans, we've got this mentality where, you know, everybody owes it to me. After all, I'm an American. I mean, you look at the way in which these football players, you know, have been deciding they're not going to respond appropriately to the national anthem so they get down on their knee. They're not going to stand up. Do they understand that the rest of the world doesn't make millions of dollars like they do for playing games? Are they not thankful for what they have in this country? Do they not understand that this country is a Christian nation as it was founded, though the devil has sought for years to undermine that foundation and eat it away and give us all this entitlement mentality? Give thanks, not ask for thanks. We're directing our thanksgiving to someone who has done something for us that we did not deserve. Do you think you, were, you deserve to be born in the United States instead of being born in Zimbabwe under the last 37 years of Robert Mugabe? Do you think you deserve being born in the United States instead of communist China? Do you think you deserve being born here instead of being born uh, in a leper colony in India somewhere? What do you deserve? Nothing. Do you deserve your good health? Do you deserve the money that you've got? Do you deserve all the nice things that you own? Do you deserve them? The answer is no. In everything, give thanks. Everything that we have, everything that we are, everything that we could hope to become, is something that has been given to us by the gracious hand of Almighty God. And to whom do we give thanks for it? We must give thanks back to Him. In everything, give thanks. And then the next phrase, this is where we want to focus today. For this is the will of God. For this is the will of God. If you want to be in the center of God's will, thanksgiving is the key. If you don't have a thankful heart, you are not in the center of God's will. Without a thankful heart, you cannot be in the center of God's will, for you will always be demanding something more. You will always be complaining about what you don't have. You will always be shaking your fist at the God of heaven and saying to him, you didn't give me what I want. Your focus will be on yourself instead of on the will of God. For this is the will of God. The phrase, the will of God, shows up 23 times in the Bible. The theme, the will of God, shows up thousands of times. The will of God refers to two things. The will of God not only refers to the sovereignty of God, that which, declares, which he declares to be, shall be, that's the sovereign will of God, he says it, it happens. But it not only refers to that which he says shall be, but it also explains his perfect desire for the benefit of his elect. Let me say that again. It also explains his perfect desire for the benefit of his elect. In other words, to put it simply, it deals with the process by which he conforms his elect to the image of Christ. When we're born into this word, we're born dead in trespasses and sins. Scripture makes that very, very clear. We're not born sick. We're not born healthy and then we get bad. We're born dead in trespasses and sins. But God in his sovereign plan has chosen some to be saved. And so when he regenerates them and brings them to life, they are still sinners by nature, though now alive. After you became a Christian, did you ever sin again? Yes. Did you lose your salvation? No. Did you get chastened by God? Yes, if you're a real believer. 
Because God chastens those whom he loves, and he scourges every son whom he receiveth, if he be without chastisement. Where of all our partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. The book of Hebrews makes that very, very clear. God chastens you. He lets you go through hard times. Why? It gets back to what we were talking about earlier. Because he is burning the garbage out of your life to conform you to the image of Christ. Scripture very, very clearly ties that together. The process by which he conforms his elect to the image of Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 27. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints, according, now listen to the last words, according to the will of God. So that's what we're talking about in the context of Romans chapter 8. The work of the Holy Spirit... And the one who knows the mind of the Spirit, the Father, because the Holy Spirit is making intercession for you and me, we're the believers, we're the saints, according to the will of God. He never prays something contrary to the Father. Did you know that? Holy Spirit makes intercession for us. The Lord Jesus Christ makes intercession for us. We're told that both make intercession for us. Do they ever make intercession for us contrary to the will of God? How many think... That, that Christ and the Holy Spirit buck the will of the Father and they make intercession contrary to the will of the Father. How many of you think that's true? I hope nobody raises their hand. I'm not going to raise my hand. They always pray in harmony with the will of God. Now listen to the next verse. This is in the context of the Spirit of God making intercession for you according to the will of God. Verse 28, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them were the called according to his purpose. That means, as the Holy Spirit prays for you, and as the Lord Jesus Christ prays for you, and we're to give thanks for this, that they are praying in harmony with the will of the Father, which is that we would be conformed to the image of Christ, because that's what it says in the very next verse. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, and here it is, to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That's why bad things happen in your life. Because the Holy Spirit is praying for you to be conformed to the will of God. Because Jesus Christ is, being, is praying for you to be conformed to the will of God. And so that everything that happens in your life, the all things that are working together, are working together for your good. This is not for everybody. It's for them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. The bad things don't work together for good for those who are not elect, for those who are the reprobate. They work together for good for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. What is his purpose? He told you in verse 29. He predestinated us to be conformed to the image of his Son. That's God's purpose for you. That's an incredible purpose. Do you think we should thank God for doing that? Can you see how we can thank God for everything that comes into our lives? Because he is burning out the garbage. He is conforming us to the image of Christ. He is causing us to grow in faith. He is causing us to keep our eyes focused on eternity instead of being focused on the things of the wor world. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. My, what a marvelous thought. The will of God is to conform us to the image of Christ. How we thank him that he doesn't just sort of let us go our own way. And if it happens, it happens. And, you know, if it turns out bad, it turns out bad. And if we get conformed to the image of Christ, well, he scratches his head and says, well, I didn't think they were going to make it, but I guess they did. That's not the way God is. If God so loved you that he sent his son to die in your place for all of your sins, for which you ought to spend eternity in hell, if he loved you that much, do you think he's going to drop you at that point? No, and neither does Jesus, and neither does the Spirit of God. You will be conformed to the image of Christ as God brings the all things of life into your life to strip away all the wickedness, all the foolishness, all of the pagan background that you had, all of the things that cause others not to see Jesus in you, but to see 
Instead, the world, the flesh, the devil, the demonic forces, all the things of earth. God says, my people will be different. Can we thank him for that? Yes. But you say, I don't like the suffering. I don't like the pain that I have to go through. That's because you like the old sinful ways. But now you're a child of God. And he's going to conform you to the image of his son. In everything give thanks. Let me divide the usages of that phrase. I told you that the actual phrase shows up 23 times in the, the Bible. Let me divide it up into some categories so that you can see the major areas of the all things and the everythings in which God requires us to give thanks. The first one uh, should be obvious is thankfulness for the spiritual gifts that God has given to us. Remember, we, we have studied the 22 spiritual gifts, seven of which were temporary, uh, 15 of which are uh, for all time uh, that the church is on earth. Uh, but uh, there were the seven temporary gifts given only when the New Testament was being inspired. But thankfulness for our spiritual gifts, using what God has given to us and not complaining that we were not given some other spiritual gifts. A lot of people today say, well, yeah, yeah, but I want the gift of tongues, or yeah, yeah, I want the gift of healings, or I want the gift of miracles. Those are all gifts that stopped at the completion of the New Testament canon. We're surrounded by the church at large and the pseudo-church with people who are not satisfied with their spiritual gifts. We're also surrounded even in this church with people who never use their spiritual gifts. It is the will of God, and I'm going to show you some verses here, in fact, just a minute, it is the will of God that you be thankful for your gifts and that you use your gifts. And, you know, we did a study on spiritual gifts lasting more than six months. I hope you paid attention back then. Uh, listen now to how many times Paul refers to his spiritual gift in the context of the will of God. Paul had the gift of apostle. How many times did he thank God for his gift? Even though he went through a lot of suffering, not because he was bad, but because he was using his gift. Listen to this. 1 Corinthians 1.1 1 .1, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. And Sosthenes, our brother. 2 Corinthians 1.1 1 .1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. How did he get to be an apostle? By the will of God. God is the one who gave him that gift. How about Ephesians 1.1 1 .1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and the faithful in Christ Jesus. Colossians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother. 2 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, <laughs> according to the promise of life which is in Christ. Do you get the idea that Paul knew where his spiritual gift came from? It wasn't because he begged for it. He was busy killing Christians. God sovereignly struck him down with light from heaven. God led him blind to Damascus. And there the Apostle Paul, through the gift of a very hesitant believer who came and witnessed to him, received Christ and the gift of apostleship. And look what a difference it made. It transformed his life. It wasn't just something he'd go around and wear on his shoulder. A little badge says, I am an apostle. Ha ha, what are you? He used it. The will of God and spiritual gifts. You didn't get to choose your spiritual gifts. They were sovereignly ordained and given to you by God who made the choice. It was his will to give you those gifts. Now it's your obligation to use those gifts for the glory of Christ. Remember what I just said to you a moment ago about the two sides of the will of God? Quote, and I'm quoting myself, the will of God not only refers to the sovereignty of God, that which he declares to be shall be, but it also explains his perfect desire for the benefit of his elect. In other words, it deals with the process by which he conforms his elect to the image of Christ, unquote. Second place we see the will of God for which we should be thankful that God is working in this way. The will of God is revealed in walking in the spirit, but not in the flesh. Did you know that it is never the will of God for you to be carnal, it is never the will of God for you to walk in the flesh. You can never claim that God predestinated your carnality and therefore you are not accountable. There are people who like to twist the word of God that way. Here we find walking in the spirit and look at what the people did, how it changed them. Second Corinthians 8.5, this they did 
Speaking of the churches that were giving, and he's encouraging the church at Corinth to give, he says, This they did, not as we hoped, but first gave of their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. We find it of believers who are walking in the Spirit, who are loving one another, who are willing to sacrificially give, who are doing only that which pleases God and not themselves, not merely hoarding it for themselves, but giving to those who had needs. How about Ephesians chapter 6, verse 6? Paul is talking about how the servant should serve, and he says, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. That applies to your employment. Because he's talking about servants here. Did you know that you do it not as eye pleasers, just so that the boss will think you've done a good job? You know, you put a gloss on it, but underneath it's all rotten. You do it as servants of Christ. And when you do that, you're doing the will of God from the heart. It applies in some practical areas of life. Did you know that doing the will of God applies to living lives of moral purity? Doing the will of God applies to living a life of moral purity. That's closely connected to never walking in the flesh because moral purity is an absolute requirement of the will of God for the believer. Say, so can you prove that? Yes, I can. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication which covers all forms of sexual immorality. It is the will of God that you live a morally pure life. Now remember, we've got those two sides of the will of God. We've got his sovereignty over here declaring what's going to be will be. And then we have over here the responsibility of the believer. And God is working in our lives and bringing different things into our lives to conform us to the image of Christ. And when we resist, he chastens us. He scourges every son whom he receives. If you be without chastisement, you're an illegitimate child. You're not one of his. If you can get away with that stuff, it means you are not saved. It means you are on your way to hell. That's serious business, people. We try to kid ourselves. Some of us may be sitting here today who have played church for many years. We've pretended to be Christians. We've said all the right things. We've done all the right things. We've been with the right people in society, you know, and we've never gone out and robbed a bank, and we think that makes us pretty good. Uh, and we've never gone out and murdered somebody who thinks that's pretty good, but maybe we've got some pretty evil thoughts in our hearts that we better get rid of. Maybe we secretly watch pornography and nobody knows. Maybe we are not reporting all of our income on our income tax because we're getting paid under the table. You know, it can take many forms. Maybe we have some anger and envy and bitterness and hatred in our hearts. Did you know Jesus said that's the same thing as murder? In God's perspective. Living lives of moral purity. We're approaching Christmas right now. Do you know that the emphasis on moral purity is one of the principal reasons and purposes for the incarnation of Christ? One of the principal reasons for the incarnation relates to moral purity. Galatians chapter 1, verse 4. Who, speaking of Jesus, gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Now listen to the last phrase. According to the will of God and our Father. Yes. That's one of the principal reasons for the incarnation according to Galatians 1. Here we have another one. We're running out of time. It's the will of God that we flee from worldliness. That means that we have a biblical worldview, of course, but it also means that we reject the lure of the world to, to, to make material things our little gods. For example, avoiding covetousness, which the Bible says is idolatry in Colossians 3.5 and Ephesians 5.5. 5. Covetousness is idolatry, and the covetous man is an idolater, very clearly stated in Scripture. It is the will of God that you flee from worldliness. How about Romans chapter 12, verse 1? Uh, excuse me, 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect, say it with me, will of God. Do you think God has made his will pretty clear? 
He's giving us these major divisions in which we find multiple illustrations throughout Scripture. Five, it is the will of God that we serve the generation in which God has placed us. It is the will of God that we serve the generation in which God has placed us. That's number five. It is no accident that you were born at this time in history. It is no accident that you were born in the United States. It is no accident that you're in this church in Collingswood, New Jersey. It's no accident that you're here this morning. You have a responsibility not only to the body of Christ and the use of your gifts, that was the first thing we looked at, but you are also responsible for your personal impact on the world around you in this generation. Listen to it. This is the apostle uh, speaking in Acts 13, 36. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. Did you get that? For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God. Are you serving your generation by the will of God? Part of that, in fact, a major portion, the inroad, the way that you get in, is with a thankful spirit. And they look at you and say, wow, you're sure different than all the rest of us around here. You're thankful, and the boss didn't give us all a raise this year. You're thankful, and your family member just had some horrible sickness. And you're thankful? I'm thankful they didn't die. I'm thankful that there were good doctors that didn't live in the 17th century. What are you thankful for? Number six, strict obedience to the Bible is the will of God. Strict obedience to the Bible is the will of God. It is never the will of God for you to disobey a command, a prohibition, a principle, or an application of the Bible because the Bible reveals the specific will of God in the context of human history and in the context of prophecy. Doing the will of God is not merely knowing the will of God. Doing it is essential for the Christian life. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36. For you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promises. We gripe and complain because we don't get all the promises. Well, the question is, have you done the will of God? You have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. How do I know the will of God? Look in the Bible. How about 1 John 2, 17? The world passeth away and the lust thereof but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. All the stuff that you focus on down here is going to pass away. And I've told you in the past that phrase there is, is a word for winding up a dead body in a burial shroud. It passes away. The world is already wound up in its dead burial shroud. Why would you keep hugging the dead body wound up in the burial shroud? You drop it in the ground. The world is already wound up in its burial shroud. passes away. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. How about Mark chapter 3 verse 35? For whosoever shall do, this is Jesus speaking, whosoever shall do the will of God, the same as my brother and my mother and my sister and my mother. Did you know people are watching you as to whether or not you're doing the will of God? Listen to what Peter says, 1 Peter 2 15. For so is the will of God that with well doing, not with well thinking, not with well believing, with well doing, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. That's how you shut their mouths. You don't just talk about it. You do the will of God. And with well-doing, you put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. That doing even includes the things that we might consider living little things. Romans 1.10 making request if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come to you. That means, do you, do you, you know, always pray that God will give you a speedy journey that will glorify him? Paul was praying that. Have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. How about uh, it including attitudes? Romans 15, 32. That I may come unto you with joy by the will of God and may be with you refreshed. The will of God includes the attitudes that you have. It's the will of God that you pray for other believers to be in the center of God's will. Did you know that? When was the last time you prayed for anybody here in this congregation? Father, I pray that you will help so-and-so to be in the center of your will. Now, I'm not going to take a show of hands, but when was the last time you prayed that for everyone in the congregation? I pray that for every one of you every day that you'll be in the center of God's will. 
You say, well, show that to me in the Bible. Okay, Colossians chapter 4. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you, not for himself, for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. <laughs> yes. It's the will of God that you take suffering in the same way that Christ took suffering. 1 Peter 3.17 For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. That's what happened to Paul. That's what happened to Peter. That's what happened to all the apostles. How about 1 Peter 4.2 That we no longer should live the rest of this time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. How about chapter 4, verse 19? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. It's the will of God that we respond to suffering in the same way that Jesus responded to it. Instead of complaining, instead of griping, instead of saying, I don't want this, God, give it to somebody else, that we respond in the same way that Christ responded you know, you have the promise of the Holy Spirit making intercession for you to be conformed to the image of God. We read that just a moment ago. He that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Be thankful for that, even though that means that the Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit are making intercession for you in that confirmation to cut away all the wickedness, all the worldliness, all the filth, all the rot, all the corruption, all the old world view, all the ways of thinking that don't glorify Christ. We're to be thankful for that. And thanksgiving, of course, is central to the will of God. God always judges complaining, as we've seen in our studies in Exodus. But God always blesses those who are thankful, those who understand that nothing ever happens in their lives that is not designed to conform them to the image of Christ. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And I'll just summarize that last two phrases. In Christ Jesus, the heart attitude of those who understand their awesome position in Christ is a heart filled with thanksgiving. And I had many verses on that. And then the final two words, concerning you, concerning you. Thanksgiving has to be personal. It's not general. It's not a nice idea. It's not just a suggestion. In everything give thanks is an imperative. That means it's a command. It's not merely a warm time of worldly, fuzzy human feelings, but it's an awe-inspired reverence before a holy God who owed us nothing. He's not giving things, good things to us because we deserve it. He's giving good things to us in spite of the fact that we didn't deserve it. And we haven't learned to say thank you. He gave us everything. He gave us his best. He gave us his son, Jesus Christ. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Gracious Heavenly Father, again we thank you for everything in life and of life and about life. For it is your will in Christ Jesus to whom you are conforming us to his image. Though some of that is very hard and very difficult, it is your will concerning us. Father, Everyone here in this room and listening over the internet has very difficult personal problems at some level. But Father, you have allowed those things, and in fact you have ordained those things, to come into our lives to cut away our lack of faith, to cut away our slothfulness, to cut away our carnality, to cut away our covetousness and greed our idolatry, to cut away all those things that are called the seven deadly sins, to make us focus on eternity instead of focusing on earth, 
For the things of earth pass away and grow strangely dim when we focus on Jesus. You bring the pressures and the difficulties into our lives so that when we finally reach the state where we say, I am helpless, Lord, I can't handle it by myself anymore, I turn to you. I give you thanks for what you're doing to conform me to the image of Christ. And then, Father, what joy it is to receive the blessing and the peace of spirit that comes when we learn to say, thank you to you, which will reflect in the way that we treat others when we say thank you to them. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing